You're watching Bread and Roses, a weekly political social magazine that's broadcast in English and Persian via New Channel TV. Hello everyone, I'm Aram Namazi. Now Fadi Bospuya, we're very glad to be back. Yes, we missed you. <laughs> you missed us. Uh, in this week's program, we um, interviewed Gona Said from Kurdistan Secular Center about secularism in Kurdistan. We'll also be talking about the atheist in Saudi Arabia who's recently been arrested for his atheism and is facing a long punishment because of it. We'll talk about the ridiculous Borkini, a fatwa about praying with your wig on or a fake beard as well as cycling, women cycling in marijuana, even though it's been considered sinful by the Iranian regime. Don't go away. In the week that passed, we have news of a 20-year-old Saudi atheist. He has been sentenced to 10 years in prison, 2,000 lashes, because he's an atheist. And what's interesting in the news reports, they said that they've asked him to recant and he refuses to do, do so and says, this is what I believe, what's wrong with that? 20 year old, 28 year old man, no name has been mentioned. Um, I guess they're afraid of the campaign, like Raouf Badavis internationally. Um, and the interesting thing is that in Saudi Arabia, um, freedom of conscience and actually saying you are an atheist is deemed to uh, be act of terrorism. Yes. So, and actually, the trial and the law is within the anti-terror law in Saudi mm -hmm. Arabia, and that's, that shows how ridiculous these um, religious dictatorships are, both in Iran, Saudi Arabia, and places like that. Yeah, I mean, you've got a terrorist regime telling someone who's written that they're an atheist on Facebook, calling them a terrorist. I mean, talk about the insanity of the whole thing. I mean, I think one of the things that this case shows is just how dangerous it is for atheists in many countries, particularly those where there are apostasy and blasphemy laws. Of course, all of a lot of them, vast majority, all of them where there's a death penalty, it's Islamic states or Islamic influence, isn't it? Yes, I remember in the 1980s when the um, uh, Islamic regime massacred a whole lot of the oppositions in prison, there were only one question they would ask you. Do you believe in God yeah. or no? If you say no, I'm an atheist, or stand your ground in terms of defending God, you, you'll get immediately executed. And 30,000 30, people were executed uh, within a shorter space of uh, you know, a month. Yeah, and that's why I, you know, the Islamic scholar, uh, Qaradawi, who's considered a moderate by some, he had said very clearly that if there were no apostasy laws in Islam, there wouldn't be any Islam. And part of that fight back in, in the, the Islamic movement is to suppress atheists for this very reason. Yeah. Um, you know, and of course, that's one aspect, one important aspect of this uh, Islamist movement. The other aspect is control of women. And that brings us to the hot topic of last week, which is the ridiculous, absolutely ridiculous Borghini. Yes, I think you, you could see, you know, this is a uh, burkini, hijab, burqa. These are exactly the uh, same sort of um, Islamist attack on women's freedom, women's body. And this is, you, you could see that, you know, the, the whole line of that is a, a clear line and connection with the Islamist movement. There's nothing, uh, you know, liberatory about yeah. uh, a burkini, hijab, or, uh, or niqab. I mean, so on all three cases, people argue this is part of individual sort of choice, which isn't actually. <laughs> Sorry, that was, I thought that but was that a joke. But that brings us to the question of whether it should be banned or not. Yeah, but before that, I just want to say that the person who made the burkini in Australia, she talks about how it's meant to liberate women and how it's comparing the ban in France to the Taliban. Now, I'm not for the ban in, in France, and neither is, by the way, the French government, because uh, government officials have come out against it, as has the highest court in France, saying that a ban uh, of this nature is not possible, it's unconstitutional. I mean, it, it's really, really difficult to argue a case that somebody um, in the uh, seaside sitting and wearing sort of clothes under any prefix, with his religious, uh, you know, under, under any... Uh, you know, pretty to actually wear that and go and 
order them to remove that. I think that, that's you know not really defending any um, individual liberty to some extent yeah, is, is is uncomfortable. I I wouldn't very um, support it. Yeah. But I think that's one issue. The other thing is that at the same time we need to recognise Burkini, hijab, niqab. They're all part and parcel of the Islamist attack and assault on women yeah and it's part right. of controlling women's bodies but i, I mean it the thing is too it, it needs, needs to be fought. fought and this is very different you know the ban on conspicuous religious symbols at schools was an important gain for children for children's rights for separation of religion and the state because it says don't proselytize don't bring religion into educational institutions into the court for example into the state that's a very different matter then arresting someone or demanding that someone remove their clothing on a beach. What they do in their private matter, going about their daily lives, is their own business and the state really shouldn't have a role to play. Now some will say, well then how come you supported the Borka ban in France? And Everywhere. In, in the public yes, space. Yes. Again, that's because it is the erasure of women's bodies completely. It's putting women in a straitjacket. That's a very different thing. But while you might think the hijab, you know, the headscarf, the chador, the borghini, they are ridiculous in the public space. I think they are ridiculous. They are symbols of women's oppression. Nonetheless, people have to be able to do what they want in their and, private and lives. It, and it's difficult to actually, by law, to um, um, exclude that you know, and remove that from individual sort of um, ability to, um, to use hijab. Um, or Burkini, um, legally I think it's, it's just not right to um, to ban it and I think that's... Yeah. But also, I mean, was. if you're, you know, yes, France has been rocked by uh, terrorism and Islamist terrorism, as have many societies in the Middle East and North Africa, attack the Islamist movement. Mm. Why are you targeting women on the beach? It's ridiculous. Yeah. Focus on the real enemy. Yeah, and a lot of times women are victims of that enemy too, and we, we shouldn't forget that. This past weekend at the National Secular Society's 150th anniversary, we met up with Gona Saeed of the Kurdistan Secular Center to talk about secularism in that region and people's resistance against Islamism. Stay with us and listen to this wonderful interview. Gona Saeed, it's wonderful to have you on our program. I wanted to ask you about this amazing Kurdistan Secular Center that you've started. It's the first secular center in Kurdistan. Absolutely. Congratulations. Thank you. Uh, Thank tell you. us about it. Why did you start it? Oh, um, we started for various reasons, basically. Um, the most important one is to push back on the this imposed religious culture on our lives, on the lives of people in Iraqi Kurdistan um, that's been um, kind of organized, systematically imposed upon people's life in the last 25 years um, at the hand of the political Islam uh, parties as well as um, the, the other uh, nationalist parties in Iraqi Kurdistan. So basically the main aim, we, we, we established the Kurdistan Secular Center so we create the counterculture. Uh, and a modern, a secular culture. Um, although um, we, you do see that people, majority of people, I would say, they do want to live their life in a secular way. Um, they do want good education, good health, they want to enjoy their lives, they like music, they like dancing, they like all the, the modern society's enjoyment in their life, as well as their freedoms of speech, the freedom of writing, of art, of um, culture. But then these all are being kind of censored in many ways by um, the religious uh, mullahs and imams. Uh, it's, uh, as I said, the, the um, Kurdistan regional government has systematically worked on, um, imagine we have almost most than, more than 5,000 mosques in Iraqi Kurdistan. We have around 3,000 uh, Friday prayer uh, preachers who speak uh, against secularism, against women's rights, against all the freedoms uh, of human beings in this society. So really we want to uh, work on that. Also we want um, to campaign for a secular constitution because uh, you might know that 
um, we have a draft constitution at the moment for Kurdistan regional government, and uh, the draft constitution was on the agenda to be finalized. So we launched a campaign last year uh, to call for a secular constitution. Uh, the other thing is the emergence of Islamic State in the last few years, their attack on North Iraq, especially the genocide they committed against the Yazidi community and the other religious minorities. That, and also, they brought a big threat to the borders of Iraqi Kurdistan. As you might know, the, the um, Peshmerga forces, they are in fight um, against the Islamic State and they have been there. Um, but then that was one threat. The other threat was the amount of young people who joined Islamic State from Iraqi Kurdistan, who were influenced by the religious um, imams from the mosque. They were influenced to join ISIS and to, to, to go and fight for ISIS and stand against the people uh, who are trying to protect um, their families, actually, in Iraqi Kurdistan. So that was a, another threat that I think people have felt that we have to deal with this emergence of uh, ISIS ideology extremism, Islamism, and fundamentalism within the, the communities, uh, within the cities in Iraqi Kurdistan. So I think that was another main reason for us. And so it wasn't an idea, but it was the emergence of a counter movement, counter resistance from the people against all this. I wonder what sort of support you're getting, because okay. you do see a lot of secularists from Kurdistan, don't you? And also, from, from Middle East and North Africa, there is that sort of counter-opposition to the Islamists. So what were people's reaction to the, the centre? Um, I think, um, well, we had a brilliant launch, I have to say. When we took the, uh, when we kind of, um, a, a number of um, people who were academics, activists, political figures, when we came together and um, discussed the idea of having a SIG in Nasha, a Kurdistan Secular Centre. Um, I think it was very widely um, welcomed amongst the intellectuals, let's say. Um, and then later we had a really very successful launch. Uh, about 200 people attended um, in the heart of Soleimania city, and it was a big, uh, big um, issue. Uh, so in the few days um, followed that, we were in all the mass media in Iraqi Kurdistan, all the TV channels, all the radio channels, everybody was asking us who, who you are, what you're doing, what is your aims. Um, so it was a very good um, reception. Uh, what followed that was a series of seminars, raising awareness seminars, all in many different towns. So we took our issue, the issue of secularism and discussing secularism to the little towns and cities around the big, the big cities. Um, and that was very good. But then I think what really boosted the whole um, um, Kurdistan Secular Center was the campaign for a secular constitution that started in July 2015. And that was three months after our, um, our um, announcements, our launch. Um, what happened, it, it, it went beyond our expectation. The support that we had from the public, like imagine in 45 days, uh, our activists standing on the street trying to collect signatures from people, 100,000 people signed up to a secular constitution. And remember that we are talking about a population of less than 5 million people, uh, a population that has been under attack of Islamism and Islamization of its culture for 25 years. Imagine that, and it's in the heart of a religious conflict in the Middle East. So imagine 100,000 people within 45 days. I think it went beyond our, our imagination. It was the greatest success. And um, so we stopped at 45 days because we wanted to use that as a sample of how many people want secularism and want a secular constitution in Iraqi Kurdistan. And we had to give that to the committee that was looking at the draft constitution. So um, it was our timeline then. So what's the position of the constitution now? Oh, um, unfortunately, because of all the political conflict in Iraqi Kurdistan, because we are going through a um, economic as well as political recession, if you if you want to call it, is 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 such a big. Um, problem uh, with the presidency of Kurdistan regional government and with the um, all the 
issues of parliament is not working, is also is damaged uh, because of all this political conflict. So everything stopped. The process of looking at the constitution has stopped. Uh, so everything is there. And we are ready to start our campaign again once that process starts again for the constitution. Tell us about the protests in Iraq. Because we were hearing about weekly protests with people saying neither Sunni nor Shia, but secularism, civil society, and hundreds and hundreds of thousands of people were coming out. Tell us Absolutely. about that, because it wasn't in mainstream media at all. No, these things, that's a, you see, today in the National Secular Societies Conference, that's one of the issues I, I kind of I mentioned. And I said, look, you don't see this. Our societies are full of people who are, who are fed up with religious conflicts. They want secularism as an alternative. And we, we are here to raise that voice, basically. And um, what happened in Baghdad, in Tahrir Square? As you say, thousands of people were in the street. Their main slogan was, uh, bread, jobs, secular state. And imagine that, the main slogan for people who are coming to the street. And that's what the reality of what ordinary people wants. They want a better life. They want a secular state. They want, they want their secular education. They want this religious conflict between the Shia and Sunnah and whatever is that to end. And this is, also, this is only happening because of the agendas of, of, you know, it's a regional conflict. We all know that. Uh, all these countries, Islamic um, Republic of Iran, Saudi Arabia, Turkey, are all involved, and it's a regional conflict uh, playing with people's lives and securities and freedoms. A final question. There'll be people who say, well, you know, secularism is a Western concept and you're imposing a sort of Western idea on, on Kurdistan. What would be your response to that? I would tell them, I, I was a, a socialist when I was, you know, when I opened my eyes, I was 12 years old and I wasn't living in the West. I didn't know anything about the West. And so is thousands of people like me who live in those societies, who have ambitions for a better life. And that's, I'm talking about me being 12 years old when we didn't have access to anything else. Now, the younger generation, they have access to internet. They know that there are things called human rights, equalities, freedoms, democracy, all these concepts that they want for themselves as well. So it doesn't make sense to say this is a Western thing. It is a human thing, and it's a universal thing. Human rights are universal, freedoms are universal, and all this, and as well as, um, as they, you know, they have made um, the whole world a, a global economy, basically, that the, 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 um, the upper class is doing their business globally. So as we have to do, we have to do our business globally as well. We have to advocate for human rights, for equality, for secularism as a one global movement. So there is no West and East in that. Thank you. Thank you. It's great having you. Thank you very much. Thanks for the opportunity. Brilliant. We hope you enjoyed the interview with Ghana Said. I mean, I think, oh my gosh, she talks about so many important issues. But for me, the highlight is the fact that, you know, there's so much going on in Iraqi Kurdistan. People fighting for a secular constitution, for a civil society. You hardly hear about it in the mainstream media. And how, you know, they're doing this in a society that has been ravaged by US-led militarism, economic sanctions, you know, the Islamists, and of course you've got the Islamic regime of Iran, the Turkish government, the Russian government, all just, you know, fighting it out in, in that area and region at the expense of people's lives. Non nonetheless, there are secularists, you know, atheists standing firm, fighting for really such a better world and society. And, and I think this is it, this, this program like Bread and Roses will try to bring these news out and share it with everybody. Yeah, we're last, so good. Last year, you remember, in uh, Iraqi, yeah. in Iraqi cities, Baghdad, and many other cities, every night after night, a lot of people will come out on the streets, uh, you know, ex declaring that they're tired of the, uh, you know, religious sects, Shia and Sunni, fighting each other, and they want secularism and civil society. Where did you find that in, in the mainstream me media? No, no, and way. I think that that's the thing we need yeah. to sort of make sure that any change, and we need to recognize that any change that is going to happen in that uh, region, it has to come through a secular, uh, uh, you know, a modern movement, secular modern movement, secular yeah. Yeah. movement. and uh, you know, many organizations in humanitarian, progressive organizations, 
in the world, if they want to see change really and combat Islamism and religious movement, they must identify with these people and support them. That's the core of the struggle. Yeah, and there's no Islamism. excuse. We live in an age of the internet where we have become a global village, where we have access to the furthest corners of the globe. There is no excuse not to seek out the secularists and to defend them unequivocally. They must be defended. The insane fatwa of this week is from India and it is from Darululume Dioband. Do you know what that means? Darululume means the scientific center. Very, it is scientific, come it on. Very scientific. very scientific. Fatwas usually are very scientific. Very scientific. So basically uh, this um, scientific institute has said that if you have a fake beard uh, or mustache or you're wearing a wig, that your prayers are sinful because when you're washing and doing vuzu for preparation for the prayer, if you've got a wig on, it doesn't really touch your scalp and you're still dirty. Poor bald <laughs> people who have no hair. I think it's not right, is it? It's sad. It's, it's just, sad. It's but just th wrong. They have been quite kind to bald people because they've said, like, if you're embarrassed to come out to pray without your wig, Take it out in the toilet, do your vuzu, and then put your wig back, back on. on. Make sure it's straight, though. You know, you don't want it to be like halfway hanging out, or you don't want your mustache to be sort of like, you know, <laughs> the wrong way on. <laughs> you know, then it's fine. You're perfectly fine. You know, and I, I and I, all I can say is, thank goodness for scientific centers like the Dia Band. This is, and you know, these guys are in charge of the most of the mosques in Britain. Half of the mosques in Britain are, are, uh, are run by the Diobandis. Very, very scary, not funny. The slice of life this week is from Marivan, Iranian Kurdistan, and it's about environmentalists who came to talk about how to protect the environment and encourage people to cycle. And when women cycled, uh, then the security forces arrested them, saying it's sinful for women to cycle. And so the environmentalists and women's rights campaigners joined together and they cycled in public, uh, despite the ban. I mean, there were a few of them were arrested and um, held until they uh, agreed that they wouldn't ever cycle again <laughs> in public. And then they released them. But that didn't stop the... Um, activists to come out, all of them together, and actually they've continued to um, to cycle, and actually made it a, a normal thing in Marivan. So the fight is still continues in that city. Yeah, and if you see these Europe. photos, it's really, really, really heartwarming, isn't it? Anyway, we've reached the end of our program. We hope you enjoyed this program, and we're so glad to be back on air. Uh, so we can rant and you know about all the things that are annoying us in the world in the week that passed and we'll see you again at the same time and same place next week until then have a wonderful week goodbye goodbye And I'm Fadi Bospuya. We're hosting a program called Bread and Roses. It's a weekly program that's broadcast in Persian and English in the Middle East and North Africa, primarily Iran as well. And it's also shown on YouTube internationally. And we've been doing this since last May. We're coming up to our 
year's anniversary and yeah. we, we've had quite a lot of fun making these videos. We discussed taboo breaking, free thinking ideas. The Islamic regime of Iran has called us immoral and corrupt. And that's why the, you need to support us. We are and the alternative voice in Middle East and North Africa. Of corruption and immorality. So do support us. Here's a short video from Patreon that explains how you can help us with even just one dollar a week. That's nothing. Support us. Patreon lets fans become patrons of their favorite artists and content creators. It's different than Kickstarter because it's not about one big project that requires lots of funding. It's more for bloggers or YouTubers or webcomics, anyone who creates on a regular basis. Here's how it works. When you become a patron, you're agreeing to give an artist a tip of an amount you set every time they release a piece of content, whether it's a new song, a video, or a recipe. You can set a monthly maximum to make sure that you're always within your budget. Choose an amount, enter your payment information, and you're done. Becoming a patron allows you to view and post in the artist's stream. And in exchange for your support, artists offer additional patron packages, which might include monthly Google Hangouts, music production tutorials, pre-sale concert tickets, or anything they can offer as a way to say thanks. Patreon, empowering a new generation of content creators.